If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be starting a, a short study. Um, we just finished our study in the book of Genesis, which was lengthy. It went on for quite some time. Uh, I was praying about where God would have us, have us go for a Bible study. And we're going to be looking at uh, the little letter of 1 John, 1 John in the New Testament all the way, just a few books before you get to Revelation. First John. It's only five chapters, so it shouldn't take us too long to get through. It was written, of course, by the Apostle John. John wrote five books in the New Testament. Uh, his Gospel, three letters, three very short letters, and, of course, the Revelation. He uh, received the Revelation from, from God. And one thing about John is we know him as the beloved disciple. He was the one who leaned on Jesus' breast. He was the one who was uh, probably closest to Christ. He was one of the earliest disciples. He was originally a disciple of John the Baptist until Jesus came on the scene. If you read John's Gospel, you'll find out that it's much different than the other Gospels. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they call them synoptic Gospels because that word means seeing it from the same vantage point. And those Gospels, when you read through them, you read a lot of things that are similar. They, re they uh, report a lot of, of the same things. John's Gospel was written much later than the other Gospels. And John, having been one of the first disciples, he gives us things that the other ones don't give us. And he tells us things that the other ones don't tell us. The only, how many people, know, and I know Albert knows the answer to this question, so you ain't allowed to answer how many people know the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels? Anybody know? There's only one. Anybody, anybody want to take a guess? Excuse me? Well, Christ being risen, that's in all four, yeah. But I mean, uh, one of the miracles that Jesus did, that's, that's the greatest miracle of all. But one of the miracles that Jesus did while he was walking on the earth. Hmm? No, uh -uh, not blind, born, mass. Yes? The f you're, you're, you're close. There you go. Feeding the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. That's the, only, that's the only miracle that was recorded in all four Gospels. Uh, the other ones were separate, you know. And uh, the reason is, you know, each Gospel has a purpose. Uh, Matthew portrays Jesus as the, the Messiah King. Uh, Mark is Jesus the servant. Luke is Jesus, God's perfect man. But in John's Gospel, he shows us Jesus, God in the flesh. Very God. That's why he, he starts his gospel. He doesn't start at the beginning of his gospel with a, the birth narrative, the Christmas story. But he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that's uh, really the theme of John's writings, the deity of Christ, his, uh, his personal interest in our lives, how he was completely God, and how he was completely man, and how he had an interest personally in each and every one of us. That's an amazing thing to fathom when you look at the greatness of the universe and all of creation. The God that is bigger than that, the God that is, is mightier, the God that spoke that into existence, that is apart from that, is interested in us as individuals. And John is, uh, John's gospel is the one that really uh, helps that come to light. Uh, much of John's writing, especially in his letters, he wrote later on in the first century. And when he wrote his Gospels, uh, when he wrote his Gospel and his letters, there were, uh, Christianity had been, had been fairly well developed. It was toward the end of the first century. So uh, the church had been around for a while. It had began to, to be institutionalized, okay? Began to be turned into an institution. And... Uh, there were things happening in the church, and just like you know, today, there were so many false teachings that we hear and so many things that portray itself as Christian or masquerade as Christian, yet all kinds of different uh, variances of doctrine. And there are some, some things that are Christian that are a little aberrant, and there are some things that are just like really way out there. And one of the, one of the, the, the heresies that existed in John's day and one of the heresies that he wrote about, that he deals with in this letter, is the idea 
uh, they, they called it docetism, and it was a form of Gnosticism. Those are two big words. But the word Gnostic, of course, means knowledge. And there were those, that the mystery religions, when you hear about uh, the lost books of the Bible, have you ever heard that term? And they talk about the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Gospel of Judas and uh, the Gospel of Thomas and all these books that were written years after the, the New Testament books were written. And they claim they were in the Bible. They, they weren't. They're not supposed to be there because they're not, they're not Scripture. They're Gnostic Gospels. They were written to, to try to mix up and try to profane the true Gospel message uh, that, uh, that we read in our Scriptures. So what John wrote... And what he gave us in his letters was uh, written for the purpose of assuring us that Jesus is completely man and he's completely God and that he's our friend. He's, he, he takes a personal interest in us. If some folks say that Jesus was uh, a man, that the God spirit came on somewhere down the line, and other folks say that Jesus was... Uh, a spirit that, you know, jumped on a man. I mean, all these things, that part man, half man, half God, uh, and so forth. Jesus Christ was completely God and completely man. And to the Gnostic mind, that was impossible because the way they think, and the way they think today, is that spirit and matter can never be one, can never be joined together. So John wrote his gospel in his letters to refute that. And 1 John is no exception. He wrote this letter to convince its readers that Jesus was God and completely man and that he came for, this, for the sole purpose of saving the souls of mankind. He came for the purpose of giving us a new life. We'll see as we read through here. He says some things that probably wouldn't wash too well today. Things like, you know, if a man loves God, he'll keep his commandments, and uh, a man who does sin and loves, uh, doesn't love God, and so forth. We'll get there when we get there, all right? I'm thankful that he begins his letter talking about our relationship, who Jesus is and our relationship, and what it entails. And just starting to read at verse 1, chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. He says this, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. John said, I want to assure you, this is Jesus that I'm writing about. You know, we know Christ by faith. I've never actually seen Jesus Christ. I've never touched him. I've never heard him speak audibly. But John says, listen, I saw him. I touched him. I, I heard him. I knew him personally. We've, we've heard, we've seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, and we've touched him. The word of life, John said, I can attest to this fact, that Jesus Christ was completely God and completely man. I know because I've touched him. I've heard him. I heard him speak. I've seen him. He goes on and he says, for the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. You know, what does it mean to be a witness? To be a witness. You know, we, all, we always, you know, hear about witnessing, and uh, what does it mean to be a witness? When you go, if you ever get called to court, and you have to be a witness. You have to relate something that you've seen or that you've heard or that you've experienced in a court of law. John literally saw Christ, touched him, heard him, spent time with him, spent three and a half years with him. Now, none of us really have that testimony. You know, we didn't live back then with Jesus. But every one of us, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a testimony. You, you can be a witness to what Christ has done in your life. I think we can all put our hand up and say, Christ has done something in my life. Amen. Maybe big things, maybe little things. If he saved you, like our brother said, resurrected from the dead, that's, you know, the fact that I have a hope of eternal life, that's enough if he doesn't do anything else. If he doesn't heal me, if he doesn't, whatever, I, that's, that's enough right there. But there's so much more. 
We're supposed to be witnesses. John testifying to who Jesus was, God in the flesh, 100% God and 100% man. He says in verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Why do we witness? Why do we share our faith? We have to ask ourselves that question sometimes because there's a lot of people out there. If, if, a lot of times you'll go out on the street, and, I, and I, I've been out with folks, and some of you have been out on the street corners and so forth, witnessing. And you have to ask, why do I want to do this? When I go out and hand out tracts, go out and tell people, my, you know, anybody who will listen to me. Some folks do it because it seems like the cool thing to do. Because somebody told them they had to do it, you got to do this. Some people do it because they, it's kind of like a badge. You know, they wear it and they, it's, you know, I've, I've got three or four saved today and so forth. But the real purpose, and that's okay, the real purpose is to lift up, to tell people about who Jesus is and what he did. That's what the witness is about. Because it's God's will that nobody should perish. And he says, John says, that we declare him unto you, I'm telling you about Jesus, so that you can have fellowship with him just like I do. As a believer, I have fellowship with God. I, think I, I, I cherish my, my time of fellowship with the Lord. I would love to invite other people to come and have fellowship with God. That's what witnessing is all about. Even if it's not with me, if it's somewhere else. Fellowship with Him. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, why? That your joy may be full. See, John was writing this to, to believers who were living in a time when, when Christians were being persecuted. Uh, the faith was being attacked by heresies on all sides. And John said, listen, I want you, I want you to have full joy knowing that this Jesus Christ is real, don't believe what the Gnostics tell you. Don't believe the stuff you read in the papers. I want you to have the full joy knowing that this Christ that we worship is real. And he wants to fellowship with you. The God of creation wants to spend time fellowshipping with you. There's a, there's a video. I should, I should hunt it up. Maybe I will. About somebody having coffee with Jesus in a coffee shop. Okay. <laughs> I'll dig it up somewhere. The fellowship, too often, the fellowship that we have with Christ is one-sided. We, we, we spend all kinds of time telling them what we need or what we think. Or, but his fellowship that he wants to have with us, it's just like what they had in the garden when, they, when he, uh, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. It's an exchange. Fellowship is, you know, exchange. Okay. Reading on a little bit. And we're not... We're going to get too far tonight. We're just going to look a little bit at this first passage. <clears throat> this then is the message we have heard of him, John says. And we declared unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now this is one of the statements that you've got to stop and you've got to say, hmm. Because I know I'll say this for myself and for everyone. I think I could probably say this for everyone here. That if you look hard enough, somewhere, you're going to find a little darkness. And, you know, not any big amens on that one, but somewhere, if you're a human, and I'm not saying that that, you know, well, you know, we'll go ahead and sin, we're human, why we'll sin. I'm not saying that. Don't, don't put that on me. But, Somewhere, all of us, somewhere, we got, you know, in our quiet times, when we're thinking about people and things, sometimes darkness will ri rise up. Well, he says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, what well, well, are we? We're liars. When John talks about walking in darkness... He talks about living in darkness. He's, he, and we're going to see this as we go through these passages. 
He's talking about habitual practice of sin. You see, I've said this a million times so people get sick of hearing it. How, you can't be saved and continue to sin without conviction. If you get saved, you'll still sin, but you'll be convicted. Before I was saved, I didn't think I did anything wrong. I figured I knew it all. I figured, hey, if it feels good, I'm going to do it. Ain't hurting anybody. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And that, to me, sounded okay. But when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came and dwelt in me, and God put his light in me. And what does light do? Light reveals things, doesn't it? The, the brighter the light, the more gray you can see. The brighter the light, the more wrinkles. I don't have any wrinkles. Men don't care about wrinkles. Slaves don't. The brighter the light, the more it reveals. So when the light comes to dwell in us, it will start revealing things about us that God says, this is something I want you to bring before me. This is something I want you to wrestle. This is something I want you to deal with. You can't be saved and have the light in you and continue in unconvicted sin. Okay? If you're saved, if you're born again, and you find yourself straying, God will convict you, the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. Anybody here ever been convicted of sin? I hope so. I hope all hands go up. That means, and, and, and some folks will say, oh, well, it's just my conscience. Well, our conscience plays a certain part in that. But it's more than just our conscience. You know, there's some people that, whose consciences are seared. Have you ever known anybody like that? They can call them sociopaths. They, they don't know. They can do wrong, and they don't think it's wrong. They don't care. They'll go and do whatever they want to do, and, just, and they don't think it's wrong. They're dangerous people. They have no conscience. Their conscience is seared. But the Holy Spirit in our conscience convicts us. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, I'm a believer. I love Jesus Christ. I'm born again. Covered with the blood of Jesus. If I say that, and I walk in darkness, I consciously, deliberately, without conviction, without any kind of remorse or re repentance, walk in darkness, there's something wrong with my testimony. That's a bad testimony. That's a bad witness. It's like a witness going up on a court stand and committing perjury and getting found out. Now again, is anybody in here perfect? I'm not perfect. I don't think anybody else here is either. We have our faults. We have our things that we deal with in our lives. Yet we walk in the light, and that light shows us the darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another. We can fellowship with one another because we have the same light dwelling in us. See, this is what John, listen to what John is doing. He's, he's establishing the fact that spirit and flesh came together so that we who are flesh can have the spirit of God and can be holy and righteous and be witnesses as to who God is. Why? Because we have the light. And if we have the light and we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, what? Cleanses us from all sin. Now some folks will say, well that blood he's talking about, that's the sins before the cross. Before the cross, you come to the cross in the blood of Jesus, and all your sins are cleansed. Now you've got to start, you know, doing, don't, don't, don't blow it. You've got to go back to the cross. Some will say, you know, that's just the sins before the cross. But I believe the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. Again, this isn't a blank check that I can just go ahead. Well, hey, I'm washing the blood. I can do anything I want to. I can sin. I can. It's not that. See, see, people will, will, will take that and they'll turn that around and they'll try to make it sound like, hey, it's all right. He says, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship. And if we have fellowship and we're in the light, 
Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. He cleanses me from sin. And guess what? He cleanses you from sin too. So I can have fellowship with you. I don't have to look at you as a sinner. Because, you know, there's folks out there in the world that are sinners. I don't want to fellowship with them. I'm out going witness to them. I, I love them. I pray for them. I care for them. I care for their souls. But I don't want to hang out with them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So you can love them but not like them. Listen. I pray for them. Witness to them. Go out there and rub elbows. Jesus went where the sinners were. I'm not saying we should lock ourselves in a room somewhere with, you know, praise music on. That's all right once in a while. But we need to get out there. That's, but the fellowship that I have is with believers. I want to fellowship with you. I want to hang out with you. Why? Because you got the same light as I got. You got the same spiritual DNA as I got. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Might not agree about everything. Might not, you know, have the same likes or dislikes or tastes. But we got the same light. John is establishing this fact as he goes into his letter and talks about love and talks about light and life. He says, we all have the same light. We're all on the same wavelength. Some of us have been in the light a little longer than others. others some of us have gone closer to the light and a little more mature, and some of us were just approaching certain things, maybe just starting out. We're all at different levels, but we all have the light of Christ in us, the light of life. Now listen to what he says. Because now there's some folks, some folks teach sinless perfection. You ever hear that? There's some people who will preach that since I got saved, I'm done with sin. Well, okay. I'd like to ride home with them in the car. I like to sit there and watch them while they're watching the football game and their team's losing. <laughs> you know. Some of us teach a sinless perfection. A lot of the old-time Pentecostal churches, this one goes back 100, I don't know, 115, I don't know, a long time. It goes back one. Some of them used to teach sinless perfection. They used to teach... Uh, Sanct, 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 sanctification. And I believe in sanctification. But a lot of the churches used to teach that sanctification was like a one-time deal. You hear the old timers stand up and say, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And they say, I got saved, and then, and then at one point I got sanctified. And I never could figure out, you know, how did they know they got sanctified? I mean, did they stop sinning completely? I'm looking for that time. <laughs> I'm looking for that Sanctification is a, is a lifetime process. It begins as salvation. God begins conforming us to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, making us into him, His image, uh, filling us with His Holy Spirit, making us righteous. That's sanctification, making us into saints. Okay? But there's some churches that teach that sanctified was like right now. But, and some churches teach that there's a sinless perfection. Some folks teach that, you know, once you're saved, you, well, that's it. And I believe, being saved, I believe we have the power not to sin. Okay, don't, you know, I don't, 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 nobody read nothing into what I'm saying. There's some folks that say, well, you got to sin. I, you don't have to sin. But, do we? Even if, even if nobody sees or hears. <laughs> he says this. If we say that we have no sin, I don't sin. I'd like to have a day where I could get, come to when I go to bed and say, I haven't sinned today. <laughs> I'm striving for that. Okay. It says, if we say we have no sin, what? You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. If you walk around telling folks, well, oh, man, not me, I'm not a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But you know, I find that when I, when, I, when I blow it, when I do something that I know isn't right, it's, it's three things. We're going to see it in a minute. Well, not in a minute, but in a couple of days, in a couple of weeks. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. Some other folks will say the world, the flesh, and the devil. <laughs> 
That, see, as long as I'm in this body, I'm prone to what? I'm prone to sin. Because this flesh has not been redeemed. It has hungers. My flesh has cravings. Okay? It wants, it wants fed. And you can tell, I'm pretty good at feeding it. <laughs> okay. As long as I have this flesh, I'm going to be prone to sin. But listen to what he says. So here's the good news. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Somebody tells you they haven't sinned in a couple weeks, just, you can say, well, you just did because you just lied to me. Okay. According to God's word. That's what it says right there, doesn't it? Okay, but listen, to me. Here's, here's the glorious thing. This relationship that we have with a God-man, this relationship that John's talking about here, that we have with a God-man, flesh and spirit together, See, this is what ought to make us shout. If we, what? Confess our sins. Now, it doesn't mean we go to a church and go in a little room with a guy on the other side of the... Because I was, I was raised with that. I was raised with that. Some of you, a lot of you were too. You know, Catholic stuff. God bless the Catholics. I, I have a cousin who's, who's a Catholic. And I think she's saved. I really believe. Speaking with her, she, I, she found the Lord Jesus. Just recently. And I'm believing that God will like show her, show her the way out <laughs> of, the, of the cab. But she, I, but she loves the Lord. And I, I believe there's a remnant in every church. But I was raised in there. And every, every Saturday evening, I had to take my Saturday night. I guess they don't do it every week now. But we had to go every Saturday to church. Go in that little room with that guy on the other side of the... They had the, they had the screen there. But you could see who it was anyway. You could see through that thing. And you say, oh, my Father, forgive me for I am heartily sorry for having offended you. Go through that, you know, say the prayers. And you tell them all your sins. Confess your sins to them. Anybody here, you know, grow up Catholic? Grow up Catholic? You tell, you tell them all your sins. And after that, he would say, depending on the depth of how horrible, what, you know, like a 10-year-old kid can do, you know. He would give you our fathers and Hail Marys and glory bees and, you know. I said this before, and I, there were times when I had to make stuff up because I couldn't think of anything I did all week. I, said, I would say, well, I lied, <laughs> you know. And you confess. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about going to a pastor, but sometimes it's good if there's something eating at you. Sometimes it's good to find somebody trustworthy. I mean, you ever confess to somebody you wish you hadn't? If you're going to confess to somebody, make sure it's somebody you, you trust to let into your inner court, okay? Just don't confess to anybody. Okay. But it's not talking about that personal confession. He's talking about confessing our sins to God. Now this word confess, this word confess, it means to say what God says. To say what God says. So in other words, when I confess my sins to God, I'm agreeing with him that I have sinned. I'm agreeing because a lot of times we try to justify stuff we do. We say, oh, that's not sin. Ah, uh, yeah, I know this is written years ago, but that's not sin. I can go ahead and do this, and that's not sin. And we, and we justify anything. But confession is owning up to what we've done. That's all it means. It means going to God and say, God, I know what I did here was wrong. I know what I did. I confessed. You know, I, I, uh, it amazes me how people... In the public limelight, for instance, how many remember this quote? I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> how many remember that, okay? How could, you know, when my parents would, would catch me in something, I would say, yeah, you know. <laughs> but how could, I, 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 that, that, that always amazes me, the president the most powerful man on the face of the earth. And, and, you know, recently we've had the thing with the one who was running, Herman Cain, who I like Herman Cain. All these allegations are coming forward. Maybe he's telling the truth. I hope he is. I really do. I, I like the guy. I hope he's vindicated. If he's telling the truth, I hope he's vindicated. But if this stuff really happened, why couldn't he just say, 
Yeah, I did. If he was a Democrat, they'd have made him king by now, for goodness sakes. They love Bill Clinton, you know. <laughs> Forgive me for that. But I hope there's, if there's any Democrats, I'm sorry, I apologize. But, but that's what they, you know, they thought, he was, they thought old Bill was the greatest thing since sliced bread. All right. Confession. I got all, way off the track. You should have stopped me. Somebody should have threw, threw something at me before I got. If we confess our sins, if we come to God and say, God, I've sinned. I've done it. I'm, 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 I'm guilty. Here's what it says. He's faithful and just to what? To forgive us our sins. Have you ever have to, had to forgive a child for something they've done? Have you ever had to forgive a brother or sister or even a spouse? Forgiveness it's one of the hardest things we have to do as human beings. But you know, with God, I don't think it's hard at all. Because of the love that he has. All he wants us to do, I've said this so many times before, when God would speak to people in the garden, he said, Adam, where art thou? God knew where he was. When he said, Adam, what did you do? God knew exactly what he did. Sometimes God comes to us and says, what, what are you doing? He knows what we're doing. But he wants to hear us confess. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to not only forgive us, thank God. Now this is for the believer. This is for the one who's been to the cross. This isn't for the world. This is for the ones that we've been born again. He's faithful and just. He'll forgive us. And what else will he do? He'll cleanse us. He'll brainwash us. See, I need my brain washed sometimes. I need, I need certain, certain areas of my brain and, and things I can remember in my history, I need cleansed out of my mind. Not only will he forgive us, that's one benefit, he'll forgive us, but then he'll begin a work in us to cleanse us from the unrighteousness. He'll change us. It might not be overnight. It might be a period of time. But if, you know, if we have a, an easily besetting sin and we continue to confess and to confess and to confess, he will change us. He'll work. He'll forgive us. And he'll change us. There's never, we can never do too many that he'll say, that's it, you've reached your limit. Thank God. John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children going on into chapter 2, and just a few more verses, and we'll be out of here early tonight. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not, that you sin not. Don't sin. Don't sin. Jack Hayford said, if you want peace, don't sin. If you want joy, don't sin. Don't sin. Now, do you think the Word would tell us that if we couldn't do it? He's saying, I write unto you that you don't sin, and if any man sin, you see, John is dealing with this. If any man sin, we have what? An advocate. We have a good attorney. My lawyer is the son of the judge. My lawyer already paid the fine. His retainer was on the cross, the blood of Jesus. My faith is really the retainer. My faith in what he's done, he's my advocate. He's my attorney. If any man sin, we know that there's an accuser standing before the judge saying, look what he did. He's a sinner. It's the same one that looked that pointed at Job and said, look at him. Same one pointed at us. You know, Job was a sinner. He needed saved. God called him a righteous man. If you read Job, God called him a righteous man, but Job had his problem. At the very end of Job, we find out that Job discovered who God is. But listen to what he says. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, Verse 2. And he is the 
Propitiation's big long word. It really means sin offering, atonement, sacrifice, propitiation. He's the sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What John is telling us, walking in the light, and he says we've got to walk in the light, and sometimes we find ourselves, you know, struggling with sin and struggling with things. He says, that's okay, we have an advocate with the Father. All we've got to do is confess it, own up to it, and we have an attorney that stands for us and defends us. He is the propitiation. He's the payment. He's the one that covered us. He's the mercy seat. It's really that what this word, that's what this word is tied into. He's the covering. You know, when we read, when we were going through the book of Genesis, and we read about Noah building the ark, God told Noah to cover the ark with pitch, which is like a tar. The word for that word pitch is the same word used for atonement, a covering. Jesus Christ covered us. He's our covering. He's our propitiation. He's the sacrifice for sins. And not only for ours, but he did it for the whole world if they'll receive it. The, 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 the provision for salvation is there for everybody in the world. If they just receive it by faith. See, before, over in Romans it says, before we knew him, he died for us. When I hated him, he died for me. That provision was made. The God-man, the light of the world, the Son of God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, when he was born in that manger, he was born for one reason, to become the covering, the propitiation, the one who would bear my sin. And not only mine, but yours and everybody's out there if they'll receive it. That's why when we go back to when John was talking about the witness, When we go to witness to people, and we go out there, or even if we get an opportunity, if we're not even intending to witness, but we get an opportunity, what do we tell them? You know, come to my church. What do we tell them? We tell them this. You're a sinner on your way to hell. You're walking in darkness. But there's a man who is the light of the world that died to take your sins in one way or another. Okay, That's the message. That's the gospel message. Plain and simple. It's the simplicity that's in Christ. I'm a sinner on my way to hell. My only hope is faith in my Savior. And that's what John is talking about. He's my advocate. He's my public defender. He's my attorney. He's the one who, who will go to bat for me. He's the one that not only will go to bat for me, but pay the price. And he's related to the judge. What more could you want? What more could you want? See, what we need to pray for, and I'm closing. I'm not going to keep it long tonight at all. Brother Jairus and I, we were, he was sharing with me a little bit about prayer time, you know, we, we pray, and I think, I think this might be, I'm really praying about, you know, every year we have like a thing, you know, like a, like a theme. Breaking the fallow ground. You know, if, if you look in the, in, in the parables that Jesus told about the, the sower, we all know that parable. It talked about seed that fell on hardened ground, walked over, passed, and we always relate that to uh, sinners, you know, going out and spreading God's word. But you know what? It applies to us too. There's some Christians who are genuinely Christian, genuinely saved, genuinely have faith in God, but their hearts have been hardened by one thing or another. There are some believers, and maybe some of us have been there at one time or another, that, that things that our hearts have been so hardened and in a wall constructed there that, that when God tries to bless us, the seeds just kind of bounce off. We're praying that God would begin to break up fallow ground. Those folks out there, the folks in here, 
hearts that are hardened by one thing or another, bitterness, resentment, whatever it might be. See, because somebody must have prayed that for me because my heart was hard toward the, the gospel at one time, and yours probably was too. But something happened to start digging that ground up. I'm not a gardener. I don't do that. One time, I, I dug a little garden in the backyard. I had that shovel, and I dug in there. My friend, you all know the story. I've told the story before. My friend that lives around the corner from me asked me if I liked vegetables. I said, yeah. He said, I'll see you this afternoon. I thought he was going to bring me a bag of vegetables. He brought, he brought two buckets full of horse manure and a shovel. He said, let's go plant a garden. I said, I don't want a garden. He said, come on, I'll go plant a garden. I'll go plant a garden. So I went out back and started digging. And I, I said, listen, I said, okay, I'll, I'll dig it up, and then you can come over. And so I dug it up, but it wasn't good enough for him. He had to dig it up more, okay? You have to, you have to if you're going to plant a garden, you've got to break the ground up. How many, do we have any gardeners in here? Okay. You've got to break the ground up. They, now you've got rototillers, you know, they, they go through the ground. Because if you don't do that, you throw the seeds on there, the birds will just come and pick them up, or they won't take root. We know, this, we know the parable. The testimony of Christ is that we're sinners on our way to hell and we have an offering, a sacrifice, a man, a God-man named Jesus Christ in whom is light and no darkness who took our sins for us that we might have eternal life. And for those seeds to take root, ground has to be broken up. has to be broken up has to be plowed up. And the only one that can do that is the Holy Spirit. You know, I could work on you all day. I've, I, you could talk to people, and we've all had that experience. You talk to people and talk and talk and talk, and it goes in one ear and out the other. But let the Holy Spirit get a hold of them and look out. People talk to me over and over and over again, and I just say, get away from me. Some of you did that too. But when the Holy Spirit jumped in, when people started praying, started sickening God on me. <laughs> there was a good story up here a few, uh, well, uh, probably about a year back now when our brother Ron Cecilia was here. I'm closing. This is his story. So I'm not going to tell the story. But he, he, he told the story. I'm not going to go into detail. He told the story how, like, before he was saved, and he's a street evangelist now. He's a street preacher. And before he got saved, he had long hair, and he was a doper and everything like that. And he said, uh, Rosetta Laycock from Lazarus Tomb. He said that Rosetta Laycock would see him walking down Freeport Road, because he lived up there. And Rosetta would look at him and say, get him, Holy Spirit. <laughs> and he tells a big, long story how he ended up in Arizona. But he got saved. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit would come and start breaking up some fallow ground. Breaking up the hardened hearts. Because this is the message. There's light. When the light came in, I thank God that somebody, somebody broke the ground up. Because I'd much rather live in the light than be walking in darkness. I remember them days. Not all of them. I, I try to forget them. But I remember some of them. When I started looking at old pictures, I, I'm, uh, I'm in the midst of cleaning my room up. And I'm, I'm not going to ramble anymore. I'm, I, have, I have a room upstairs that I guess like my little office. And it's a horrible mess. It really is. Because I'm a very messy person. I am up there. So I'm, I'm going through all these boxes of stuff, and I find all these old pictures. I used, to, I, used to like, I used to take black and white pictures. I don't know why I did that, but I did. And, uh, and I, I'm looking at the images on these pictures. I'm seeing people that are bringing back memories before I was, before I was saved. I look at that, and I think, man, I'm glad I'm saved. <laughs> I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad, I'm glad I'm in the light. Are you glad you're in the light? Wouldn't you like to t tell somebody else about that, huh? Okay, we'll continue with uh, First John next week. Anybody have any comments or questions? Or any, any, uh, anything at all?